Next, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ was God's Christmas gift, and God never gives anything but the best. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. James 1, 17 reads, Every good and perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. With deep gratitude for this gift, the apostle wrote in 2 Corinthians 9.15, Thanks be unto God for this unspeakable gift. Christmas is that blessed time of the year when nearly everyone's thoughts turns to gifts and giving. Ample evidence is in the fact of the enormous sum of money uh, spent for Christmas gifts each year. I mentioned that earlier. Can you imagine $300 billion? Giving is a Christian virtue, and it's not to be taken lightly. It's a tragedy for life to be lived in ignorance of the joy, listen to me carefully, of generous giving. To keep happiness, it must be given away. There's an old song that they uh, sung in Bangladesh. It says, a song is not a song until you sing it. A bell is not a bell until you ring it. And love is not love until you give it away. If you are selfish in nature and you think only of yourself, you are one miserable person. You really are. And that's why Americans are so miserable today. Almost every uh, year I hear of people uh, taking their own life. They have no hope because they are focused inward. How are you focused today? Are you focused inward or outward? To lift another's load is to lighten your own. As we think of gifts and giving at, Christ, at this Christmas season, let's meditate for just a few moments on this verse. Listen to me carefully. We're going to go through it. The fact of God's greatness. Number one, I want to talk about the greatness of God. The scripture says in John 3, 16, for God. And the Bible says, if God be for you, who can be against you? The Bible tells us that we've got a great and mighty and awesome God. Now, I want you to listen carefully to me. Because you see, the Greek word for God here is theos. And it means the divine. It means the one and only. Church, you need to hear it today. There's only one God, period. Amen. Allah is not God. Baal is not God. Buddha is not God. Diana is not God. Muhammad is not God. Joseph Smith got it all mixed up. I'm telling you something. The Mormons, all of them, they're cults. There's only one true living God, and his name, church, is what? Jesus. And you can say the word God, and it may mean anything, any God. But there's only one God who became flesh. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And let me tell you something, that God would love us enough that this God would be so in love with you. Are y'all listening this morning? Listen to this, that he's in love with you so much that he became one of you, that God would become flesh in the babe of Bethlehem. Think about it. what a great God that we have. Omni means all. You speak of the omnipresence of God, means that something that no one can do except God. He can be ever present everywhere at the same time. The omnipresence of God, only God can do that. And the omniscience of God, only God knows it all. I've met some people who think they know it all, but only God knows it all. Amen? Amen. And by the way, church, he knows every second that 2017 holds for you. I'd be in his house trying to seek him, wouldn't you? I wouldn't be going to some astrologer or someone trying to figure out uh, what's going to happen in the future when God's already, do you realize God's already in the future? <laughs> uh, and then I think about the omnipotent God. He's all powerful. But you know, Sherry and I were talking about this this morning, and I, I thought, wow, what a good point she made. He's immutable. That means he's unchanging. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So don't get overwhelmed when you get troubled, because God will be there. You may change, but God don't change. 
Your circumstances may change, but God won't change. I'll tell you, church, if we ever begin, listen to this, because this is the direction I feel led to go in the new year. I want to preach a series on the awesomeness of God. And, and when you begin to recognize just who God is, you can't help but worship Him. You can't help but want to serve Him. You can't help but want to live for Him. Listen to what the Scripture says in Exodus 20. We need to hear this carefully. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. Thou shalt have, he says, thou shalt not make it to thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, listen, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. Church, our God is the one and only great God. There is none beside Him. There is no one higher than Him. You talk about the greatness of God. He is described as the most high God over all the earth. Psalm 95, 1, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Psalm 145, 1 says, I will exhort you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day, no exception here. No, no exceptions. I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and His greatness is unsearchable. Boy, I could preach all day on the greatness of God. we got to move on. The, great, the greatest, not only the greatest God, but the greatest grace that He so loved us. What does grace mean? Grace means God's love and favor for us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. By the way, we're talking about God's gift, God's gift to you, the gift of God. Here's God's Christmas gift. He wrapped himself. Are y'all following me? Somebody needs to hear this. He wrapped himself up. And swallowing clothes. So anybody and everybody, I don't care what you've done, can, can come to him because he loves you. But some of you, there's somebody here today, I feel it, I just feel like somebody here today, you don't know how to accept God's love. Will you accept his love today? I mean, how would you feel if uh, someone went to the trouble to buy, purchase you a real expensive gift and they wrapped it all up and they presented it to you and you said, no, thank you, I don't want no part of it? Boy, you would, that, that would crush that person, wouldn't it? Well, that's what we're doing to God because, you see, God loves us. You know, I think, I, think, I think we crush God's spirit when we don't worship him. You know what worship really is? It's loving God back. That's really what it is, is love. And, you know, a lot of Christians have not learned that. The greatest grace is that God would love a sinner like me. Someone gave the acrostic to the word grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And there's God's. There, there's the expense right there, that he loved us so much that he would allow his son to go to the cross. The very fact that salvation is a gift indicates that it's undeserved. If it is earned or deserved, it's no longer a gift. A gift is something offered with no strings attached, and salvation is totally a work of grace. It's a gift of God. The third thing I want to give you from this verse is the greatest glory. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the world for a moment. I'm going to tell you why. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalm 8, 5 says, Yet you have made him, talking about man, a little lower than God, and your, you have crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field. God created man for his glory. And your purpose, somebody needs to hear it, your purpose, your purpose for living, your purpose for your life is to give God glory. The greatest gift you could ever give God is to live your life for his glory. I'm telling you what, you are God's masterpiece. You are. God created you not for you, he created you for Him. And the greatest glory is that His creation would give Him all the glory. Amen? Amen. And you know what? Even the dumb birds know how to do it. Amen. They do. You ever see a sad bird? 
I mean, the birds are always chirping and, and they're singing and they're happy. We go around with a frown on our face. We're miserable people many times, and I'll tell you why. God won't let you share His glory. He won't let you take His glory. Oh, you might think that you are greater than God, but you're not. And I'm here to tell you, you are the happiest. Listen carefully. You're the happiest when you're giving Him glory for your life. When you give Him praise, it's like He fills you up. I mean, it's like all of a sudden, his love is just all over you. His presence is all over you. His glory is all over you because you're giving him glory. Amen. Man. And then he's the greatest giver. We're talking about John 3, 16, that he gave. For God, what a great God. He's the greatest God. Amen? Amen. So loved. I'm telling you something. That's the greatest grace. The greatest grace is that God would love us. And then to think about how that, that uh, God wants us to give Him glory, the greatest glory. Why? Because He's the greatest giver. No amount of giving we might do can begin to compare with the giving God does. We only give because He first gave. We only love because He first loved. He gives life. He gives love. He is our provider. He's our protector. He is a God of mercy and grace. He's given you more than one chance to come to Him. There's somebody here today. God's going to give you another chance to come to Him. But this may be the last chance. You know what? Tomorrow is not promised. It never is. Could the Lord come today? Hey, He came the first time. He's coming the second time. You don't believe in the coming of Christ, then you don't believe He came the first time. You see, the Jews rejected Him because He didn't come in the package that they were expecting. They were thinking, Messiah, great deliverer, military uh, leader. He came as a lowly babe. Why? So He could be approachable to all people. Jews, Gentiles, whosoever. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But He's the greatest giver. The Spirit of Christmas is giving, and I believe that's why people are so happy at Christmas. Why is there so much joy at Christmas time? Because we're doing what He did. He gave. The greatest giver is God. Here's a great quote. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to receive what he cannot lose. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know what you believe, and there might be different beliefs here today, but Jesus is not an Indian giver. When he comes in your life, he comes to stay. And he promised you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. He's the greatest giver, and he is the greatest gift. His only begotten son, that's the greatest gift. The blessed heavenly father gave the first Christmas gift. Have y'all thought about it? Who gave the first Christmas gift? God did. God gave His only begotten Son, and that's the greatest gift known to man. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Salvation is the gift of God. Thinking of this wonderful gift, here's what the Apostle Paul said, Thanks be to God for that unspeakable gift. Rest assured that God never gives anything but the best. Jesus Christ is God's best. Jesus Christ is God's unspeakable gift. He is beyond telling. He is undescribable. He is inexpressible. Perhaps John, uh, Charles Wesley uh, was thinking of that unspeakable gift. Listen to these powerful words that he wrote. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my greatest Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. Why is God so great? Why is this gift so great? Because it's a free gift. It's a full gift. It's a forever gift. It's full because it's complete. If you got Jesus, you don't need anything else. Some people think, oh, I, I need more. I need more. The Bible says you're complete in the Godhead bodily. He's the greatest gift. And then I want to tell you this today. Not only is He the greatest gift, but we got the greatest gospel. Because it says, those that believeth in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that 
believeth in it. You got to believe. The word believe and receive are used uh, synonymously in the scriptures. The Bible says in John 1 12, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Look up here, church. You can believe and receive, or you can doubt and do without. And a lot of people doubt what God can do. Let me tell you something my God can do anything. And you say, well, my sin is so big, you don't understand. Oh, you don't understand this. My God is so big, your sin can't stand up. I can't, don't have a leg to stand on. You think you're, we, you, we give these testimonies. How big are sinners we are? We ought to give a testimony of how big our God is. Because our God's bigger than any of your sins. You say, oh, no, preacher, you don't know what I've done. But you don't know what God's done. And God did a whole lot for, for you than you realize, really. Folks, we can't understand all that God has done for us. His plan was accomplished, it was accomplished perfect, right on time. It was God's perfect plan that his son would be born as a baby. Oh, the greatest gift and the greatest gospel, but the greatest goal is this, and I'm almost done. I tell you, my God's great. I, I just, I want to sing that song. What's that song, Alan? Uh, uh, the, 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 how, how great my God is. Oh, he's so great. He, he, hey, he's bigger than big. Yes. I mean, he's greater than the greatest. He's higher than the highest. Pilate tried to accuse him. Satan tried to seduce him. Death tried to destroy him. And the grave tried to hold him. But he stands forth upon the highest pinnacles of heavenly glory, proclaimed of God, acknowledged by angels, adored by saints, and feared by devils as the living personal Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the goal for your life, the greatest goal, is that you wouldn't perish, that you wouldn't go to an eternal hell. I was fascinated to hear self and clay. I don't want to die and go to hell. Those guys get it. Judgment House sort of started this for these guys. And they both have told me, Preacher Ronnie, hell is stinky hot. That's, what, that's how they describe hell. Can a five-year-old understand that? You know, little Lucas came up, and I was praying with the deacons, talking to the deacons, and I saw him out of the corner of my eye. He stood there patiently for a good five minutes, I know, or longer. And when the deacons walked off, I sat down and little Lucas came up and he gave me a little Christmas gift. He said, I bought this for you. And Lucas, I said, Lucas, have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior? And he said, I did. He said, I was about five years old and I gave my life to Christ and I know Jesus lives in my heart and I know I'm going to heaven. And the preacher in my last church baptized me and preacher, I'm, I'm okay. Amen. 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 Isn't that a wonderful thing for an eight-year-old to know? Let me tell you something. Think about it. If you know Jesus, even a five-year-old, eight-year-old can know, I'll never have to perish. You know the neat thing about accepting Christ at Lucas' age is that he gets to live a happy, fulfilled life here. Isn't that wonderful? He don't have to go. He don't have to perish in his life. He don't have to seek the drugs for a high or an alcohol or to live like the world. You've got what you need in Jesus Christ. And the greatest goal for you is to come to Jesus. If you've not come to Jesus, you will perish. The Bible says that. But because God loved you, he made a way. And the greatest goal is that you would not perish. John 1, 12. But as many as receive him to them, gave he the power. God gives you the power to become the sons of God. I, I, I read that twice because I love it. I'm going to tell you, to believe is to receive him. God's word helps us to trust Him, to depend upon Him, to rely on Him. To receive God's Christmas gift simply means that one must admit that He's a sinner, believe the gospel story of Jesus who died for our sins and rose again. That's simply the gospel. And then the greatest, the greatest gain. The greatest gain is that you would have everlasting life. Luke 9, 25, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? The gift of God is everlasting life. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But you know what? I don't know what's going on this morning. I've prayed my heart out. God, would you be in control of this service? And I didn't follow the order of the service. Did y'all notice that? <laughs> and I didn't follow the order that I had this sermon in. There's a thing that God wants me to give you right now, evidently, because I didn't plan this. And that is the greatest guarantee, and I don't know where that is in the outline. 
But here's the greatest guarantee that no doubt God planned it this way, that whosoever will may come. Now, I, I didn't plan this sermon this way, but I'm here to tell you that God wants us to give an invitation right now that whosoever will may come. Now, we're getting ready for a baby dedication. We're getting ready to come to the Lord's Supper. But here's the greatest guarantee. Whosoever. Think about it. In the last great invitation in the Bible, our Lord opens the door as wide as they can be opened. When he said this, the last, the last invitation. And by the way, do you know the greatest invitation is that right there? That whosoever? Are you thinking with me? That's the greatest invitation God's ever given. And here's the greatest guarantee. Here's what he says. The spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is the thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. I'm going to close with this illustration. Many years ago, this I think was based on a true story. There was a man who was very, very wealth, wealthy. He was very rich who lived with a passion for fine art. He had millions and millions of dollars of artwork in his house. And he shared this with his son, this collection. I mean, at their house, they just had millions and millions of dollars of fine artwork. They had these priceless works adoring the wall of their family estate. And one day, the nation was at war, and the young boy, the son, left to serve his country. After only a few short weeks, his father received a telegram. His son had died. Distraught and lonely, the old man faced the upcoming Christmas holiday with great sadness. The joy of the season had vanished with the death of his son. On Christmas morning, a knock on the door awakened the depressed old man. He opened the door, and a soldier with a large package in his hands greeted him. I was a friend of your son. I was the one he was rescuing when he died. May I come in for a few moments? I have something to show you. The soldier mentioned that he was an artist. And then he gave the old man the package. It was a portrait of the man's son. Though the world would never consider it the work of a genius, the painting featured the young man's face in striking detail. Overcome with emotion, the man hung the portrait over the fireplace, pushing aside millions of dollars of other art. His task completed, the old man sat in his chair, and he spent Christmas gazing at the gift he had been given. The painting of his son soon became his most prized possession, far eclipsing any interest in the pieces of art for which museums across the world were, were seeking. Half a year later, the old man died. The art world waited with anticipation for the upcoming art auction. According to the will of the old man, all the artworks would be auctioned on Christmas Day, the day he had received his greatest gift, the, the picture of his son. The day soon arrived, and art collectors from all around the world gathered to bid on some of the most spectacular paintings ever. Dreams would be fulfilled that day. The auction began with a painting that was not anyone's, on anyone's museum's list. It was the painting of the man's son. The auctioneer asked for an opening bid, but the room was solid. Who will open the bidding with $100? No one spoke. Finally, someone said, who cares about the painting? It's just a picture of his son. Let's move on to the fine art to, to be sold. The auctioneer responded, no, we have to sell this one first. Now, who will take the son? And finally, the groundskeeper of the estate property of the old man offered $50. That's all I have. I knew the boy, so I would like to have it. The auctioneer said, going once, going twice, gone. The gavel fell. Cheers filled the room, and someone exclaimed, now we can bid on the real treasures. The auctioneer looked at the room filled with people and announced that the auction was now over. Everyone was stunned. Someone spoke up and said, what do you mean it's over? We didn't come here for a painting of someone's son. There is millions of dollars worth of art in this house. What's going on here? And the auctioneer replied, it's very simple. According to the will written of the Father, whoever takes the son gets it all. And that's the message of John 3.16. It's the same this Christmas. 
Because of the Father's love, whoever takes the Son gets it all. Will you take Him this Christmas? Because it's open for whosoever. You can come to Jesus today. I don't know why you've been putting it off. Maybe your whole life. I can't think of a better time to come to Jesus than right now. We're going to play this song, and I'm going to ask you to prepare your heart today as we come to this table. Now, I'm going to do the baby dedication first, but I want you to listen to this song, He Made a Way in a Manger, so that we would be able to get to that cross. Now, I'm going to be standing down here. I'm going to let uh, Kelsey come and sit here in the chair with her little baby we're going to dedicate in just a few minutes. So come on, Kelsey. And, and then I'll recognize the Rockmores. We're going to dedicate little Owen. But right now, I feel like, and I'm not following the order of service today, but I feel maybe someone has been putting this decision off. God became a little baby. That's what God did. The gift of God is that God became a baby. So he could be born so that you could be born again. Why are you putting this gift off? It's all wrapped up in love for you today. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, let's pray. And if there's someone here today, you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask them to turn the lights off right now because we're going to pray that someone will come to Jesus right now because God made a way. And as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Christians, would you confess any sin in your life right now? Anything that you need to repent of so you can be prepared to come to this table. We want to come to this table well prepared today. So I'm going to ask every Christian to bow their head and say, Lord, forgive me. Cleanse my heart that I can come to this table. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, this is your opportunity. God made a way for you to be saved today. Would you, would you make your way now? Just come on right now down this aisle and say, Preacher Ronnie, I'm tired. I've been doing things my way. God's made a way for me to come to the cross, and I want to come to that cross and ask Jesus to come into my heart. Would you pray that prayer today? All you got to do is pray this prayer. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Would you pray that? I know I'm a sinner, and I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me of all my sins, to come into my heart and save my soul. In Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer, he'll come into your heart. It's that simple. Whosoever will may come. Father, at this invitation, as we who prepare to come to this table, prepare our hearts, because you've made a way for us in a manger. I pray, God, that we will give you the worship you're so worthy of right now. If there's someone who don't know you and pardon forgiveness of sin, they've been putting off this, this decision for many years, I pray right now they'll come and say, I want to come and receive God's Christmas gift. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.